Hello, this is Taib again, and today we are going to look at 1 Samuel 3, verse 1 to 7. And the title of my study is, And the Word of the Lord was read in those days. So we are going to be covering this chapter, and the reason why I want to do it is because I believe we are living in a time where there's a lot of uh, spiritual uh, apostasy in the sense that people don't really quite care about the things of God anymore. And, uh, and this is the condition that uh, the people of uh, God were under uh, in that chapter. Between chapter 1 and through chapter 4 and 5, it talks about um, the spiritual state of, of, of the Jews at the time uh, under Eli. Eli is the high priest, and we are going to be looking at it today. And we are going to be seeing the connection between them and us today. Okay, so let's get into that. I'm going to go to the next slide. And I'm going to read you my uh, quick introduction, which I kind of gave you just now. And like I said, this is probably the worst time in the history of the people of God. The priesthood and leadership is corrupted. It seems as if God isn't going to punish or deal with the ongoing apostasy. But that's not the case, since a woman's barrenness leads her to pray an important prayer that will bring uh, God's judgment and mark the beginning of uh, the revival. Now today we are going to be looking at 1 Samuel 3 verse 1 to 7 and he focuses on the current uh, spiritual state of the people of God and Samuel's holy call to ministry. So that's what we are going to be looking at. Let's go to the next slide and get into the first um, verse. Verse 1 um, says in chapter 3, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Now, the absence of frequent vision indicated that the word of God was scarce. The people of God were not experiencing the presence of God, which made the apostasy even worse. God's voice wasn't being heard, and people did what they deemed right in their own eyes. Now, we need to know why the word of the Lord was rare. Now, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they were corrupted, and Eli never corrected and disciplined them. He never really took care of what was happening. The leadership in the church had been corrupted because of the sinful practices that were utterly disgusting in the Lord's sight. And Eli's sons completely disrespected the offerings of the Lord. They slept with the women that were serving at the entrance of the, the temple, and they suffered no immediate uh, consequences. Now, if you recall Nadab and Abihu, I think, I'm not sure if this is in Exodus, where they offered unauthorized fire to the Lord and they burned on the spot. Now, God executed them right away when they sinned against him. So you can kind of contrast that and what's happening now in the sense that Eli's sons are doing something terrible. They are, they are like looking with contempt at the offerings of the Lord. They don't care. They are sleeping with the women and they are just mistreating everything in the holy temple. And they don't suffer consequences. So you can kind of see the, the attitude behind them. They're probably thinking, you know what? We haven't died. Nothing has happened to us. So they are taking God lightly and forgetting that the patience of God is supposed to lead you to repentance. So let's read on 1 Samuel 1, verse 12 to 21 to see exactly what Eli's sons were doing. So let's, let's go to that real quick. I have the verse pulled up here. So I'm going to read uh, this section. And you see how it's labeled, Eli's worthless sons. Now, I don't want to be labeled as worthless. So when God calls you worthless, that's not good. So let's see what they did that warranted such a name. So the scripture says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. So in God's eyes, being worthless means you don't know the Lord. Because this is what scripture says in verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless, and he follows with, they did not know the Lord. The custom of the priest with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come, and while the meat was boiling, with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, or he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. 
And if the man say to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he will say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Now, think about it. This is the priest talking. Thus, the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the man treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. And Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take, to, take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked for the Lord, of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now, if you look at this, I won't give you the full explanation, but Eli's sons, they were not doing what God had called them to do. In the sense that when somebody brought the meat dish, they, they, they were supposed to allow the, um, the, the meat to be roasted first because the fat had to be burned first. And as the fat was being burned, the smell was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So they didn't want that because they wanted to eat the fat with the meat because the fat is what gave the meat the taste that they wanted. So they treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. They didn't care because according to the law of God, they were supposed to wait till the meat and all the fat had been burned up. But they didn't do that because they wanted to eat the best and the choicest meat. And thus, they completely disrespected the offering of the Lord. And then on top of that, they were sleeping with the women that were serving at the entrance of the altar. I mean, their sin was this great. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm just gi giving you a picture of what what's going on in in the in in the temple at, at the time. Like the leadership is completely corrupted, and Eli fails to correct the problem. He tells his kids, but they not listen to him, and he doesn't do anything about it. He just let it go. So you can kind of see the attitude. They are doing all these things, and God is not bringing His swift judgment. So they're thinking. We can get away with it. We've been doing this for years. Nothing has happened. We are not like Nadab and Abihu. So God is God is okay with me. I don't fear God because he hasn't done anything. So there's this kind of um, relaxed attitude where it's like, well, I don't even think all that God stuff is true because if he was, then we would have died by now. So nothing has happened. So you can kind of see the atti attitude creeping in there. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. So this is what's happening. So even though God didn't punish the saints immediately, the absence of vision should have been a clue that he wasn't pleased with their lack of repentance over their ongoing sin in the leadership. Because God will ultimately judge and deal with sin because he's righteous. The thing is this, they should have learned a lesson. Scripture says, and the word of the Lord was read in those days, there was no frequent vision. In the sense that there was so much sin that God's presence was scarce. You remember what scripture says in, in, the, in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay? So the lack of vision, the lack of the word of the Lord was showing that he wasn't pleased with the people. Okay? So this is what we are dealing with at this moment. So let's go on to the next uh, slide. So Samuel, favored by God. If you go back to verse 2, scripture says, At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, just because God isn't acting on our timetable doesn't mean that he isn't going to deal with sin. So I want you to pay attention to the highlighted phrases. Eli, for example, he is sleeping in his own place, I suppose his house. And then young Samuel, who is probably maybe 10 or 12 years old at the time, is lying down in the temple of the Lord. And not only that, but next to the ark of God. Now, here's the thing. You need to pay attention. Only one time was anyone allowed in the Holy of Holies because that's where the ark of God was. Okay? Only one time a year, the Day of Atonement. That's when the high priest was allowed in the Holy of Holies. And not only that, because when he went in there, he had to throw incense in the air so that when the glory of God came, he wouldn't be killed. Now, imagine this. Young Samuel sleeps in the Holy of Holies. And somehow, that's accepted. That's acceptable. Like, Eli is not saying, no, young man, you can't sleep here. Now, how Samuel ended up there is beyond my comprehension. I don't know how, because according to the law, no one was allowed 
there. But it shows something else. It shows first that the people were so irreverent that they didn't care. But second, it shows that God had highly favored Samuel because he did not die as a result. Now, how do we know that Samuel had found favor in the sight of the Lord? Let's take a look at verse 4 and 6, and that will give us uh, the clue. Okay, we're going to go to verse 4 and 6. Now, if you go to verse 4, what the scripture says, Then the Lord called Samuel, and, sa and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now the reason why Samuel could, could lie next to the ark of, of God and not perish is because God, God had already sealed him and ordained him prior, prior to his birth. Now if you go back to um, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 1 Samuel 1 verse 11. This is what Hannah, Samuel's mother, says. She prayed a prayer. She said this. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, or will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. So Samuel had been ordained before his birth because his mother prayed for him because, remember, she was barren. She couldn't have any children. And she prayed into the temple. She went into the temple, prayed and prayed, and God gave her that prayer because the, that prayer was birthed from a desire coming from God himself. Because God was calling Samuel. Before he was even born, he had prepared him. So he had God's favor. Okay? So God had already called Samuel from his mother's womb. And now the Lord was officially calling him to ministry. But verse, verse 7 tells us uh, the following. Like, we're going to read verse 7 now. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Now, verse 7 says, now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And this is important to understand, like the call of God, okay? Now, the reason why Samuel didn't recognize the voice of the Lord is because Samuel did not know the Lord. And this is because the word of God had not yet been revealed to him. Romans 10, 7 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Basically, God is the one who initiates, confirms, establishes, and completes our calling from beginning to end. Remember what the scripture says, the righteous shall live by faith, right? And Romans 1 also says somewhere, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith and for faith. Because God is the one who produces the faith to believe in him. And God is the one who produces the faith to trust in him. He initiates all things. He begins the call and ends it. He completes it. He, he, he starts it and finishes it. And he reveals himself to Samuel. Samuel didn't have to go look for God because God is the one that does the calling. Because Samuel would never be able to serve and know the Lord apart from God perfecting that in him. I don't want to use excessive words to explain this, but this verse is showing us that our salvation is 100% the work of the Godhead from beginning to end. Now, if you look at John 6, 44, Scripture says, No one can come to me, this is Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him. Listen to that again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is Jesus speaking. And John 6, 65 seconds that. He says, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. The reason why you believe in Jesus and actually are serving Jesus today is because God chose to reveal the word of the Lord to you. Because apart from that, you are dead in sin and your transgressions. So we can't, we can't accept God unless the Spirit himself does the work of regeneration in our heart and mind to, to make us love the things of God because by nature, we hate God. We are born with a bias. The bias is this. We don't like the things of God. We don't love the things of God. We love ourselves. And then God has to do the what? He changes our, the disposition of our heart. He changes our mindset. He changes everything through His Holy Spirit and reveals the beauty of Jesus Christ, and we receive it by faith, and we say, damn everything else, I want God. 
So the only reason why you and I can receive this salvation is because God himself has called us by his grace. Because he's undeserved. Because you and I, by nature, we are objects of wrath. We de deserve God's wrath. But he calls us because of his mercy and extends his grace to us and gives us the grace and the faith to believe the truth. And then we see the beauty of Jesus Christ and we accept this sacrifice and we mourn over our sin because now for the first time we realize how much we've offended God. Guys, this is important to understand these things. Okay? This is very, very important to understand these truths because we are living in a day and age where you've been told that you are a good person, that God loves you, that God's love is unconditional. If God's love was unconditional, Jesus wouldn't have to die on the cross. It's because of our sins. Okay? God put his son on the cross because of you and I. What we did, we committed sins against him. And what we deserve is his wrath. Okay? God is not saving you from hell. He's saving you from his wrath. Yes, he's saving you from hell. But what I'm saying is this. is the wrath of God that is coming to you. And God wants to save you from his wrath. And today, if you hear his voice, I will encourage you to listen and to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and give me the grace and the faith to trust in your finished work on the cross through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we have. That's all we have. That's the only Savior that we have. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. So don't let anybody fool you. This is serious. We're living in a very, very, very bad, bad time now. This is the worst time in our history now. Apostasy. The church is corrupted. Leaders don't even care to preach the truth. They're just preaching a cotton candy gospel, telling you God loves you. Yes, God loves you enough to reveal himself to you through his son so that you may change your ways. Salvation comes and he produces fruit in your life. So if you have no fruit of the spirit, don't make any mistake. You're not saved. Because the scripture says, by their fruits, you will know them. I'm not telling you anything I haven't gone through myself. Don't believe the lie. God is real and the, and, and the wrath is real. Don't let anybody fool you on that. This is real stuff. And if you hear his voice today, I will encourage you to repent and say, Lord, please forgive me. Because we have forgotten what it means to mourn over our sin. We don't mourn over our sins. We actually gloat over our sins. We want to tell people about how bad we were and Jesus came to save us. We really want people to hear the bad things that we did so kind of see our bad reputation. And in the process, we throw in the gospel a little bit. But we really want them to know what we've done to kind of make us look like, yeah, I used to be a bad man and then God came and saved me. That means you haven't truly mourned over your sin. When you really gloat over your sins and just talk about it, with just no shame. When you truly understand that those sins and those things that you've committed, led Jesus to bleed and die and be separated from his dad because of your sins and my sins. And you understand that he did this to save you from the wrath of God. Then the ultimate response is to fall on your knees and say, Woe, oh, I am. Please, I want you to pay attention because there's too many lies out there, false gospels that promises prosperity, Everything will be all right. God is okay with you. Now, nah, make no mistake. God is holy. He's holy in two ways. He's holy because he's set apart. And he's holy because he's morally perfect. And this is what he came to do, to make us holy. Because he said, I am holy, so I'll make you holy. Because I'm holy, you shall be holy. And God is in the process of sanctifying you, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, I think verse 3 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification. If there's no sanctification in your life, you are not saved. This is serious, guys. And I want you to really take this seriously. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.